After about five years of practice, I developed a pretty large practice of testosterone because nobody was treating it. And by word of mouth, uh, I found that a higher and higher percentage of my patients uh, that were coming in were coming in for testosterone treatment. Mm -hmm. And I welcomed it because I, I love making people feel better. Of course. Uh, and I could see that I made a bigger difference in my paper patient population for getting them healthy than any other thing that I could do for them. Mm -hmm. I could give them diets, I could put them on medicine for their blood pressure, I could treat their diabetes, I could do the normal things. They didn't get better, better. Mm -hmm. But when I put them on testosterone, I see the same transformations that happen with me. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, interestingly, uh, there was a writer that was doing uh, an article on testosterone. And so he didn't know who to call. There weren't many experts out there. Mm -hmm. So he called one of the major compounding pharmacies in the country. And I happened to be using them for my topical testosterone. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you better call Dr. Ship and he writes for more prescriptions than anybody in the country. Mm -hmm. And I said, I do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's, I'm just a country doctor here in Pennsylvania and I'm writing for more and anybody else that they have in their, their group. And so they referred the writer to me. Welcome to the Maximus Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Cam Sapa. As a clinical psychologist, medical school professor, and CEO, I specialize in helping men be better in mind, body, and masculinity. On this podcast, I interview extraordinary men as a clinician would, hearing their come up stories of how they became the men that they are today, and having them share their secrets of actionable advice on how to look, feel, and perform your best. All right, welcome everyone to the Maximus podcast. I'm super excited today to have as our esteemed guest, Dr. Eugene Shippen, who has been in medical practice for nearly 50 years, starting out in family practice and specializing in endocrinology focused on male and female hormonal problems due to aging and dis disease. He published this seminal uh, book, The Testosterone Syndrome in 1998, and is considered one of the world's foremost experts in male hormone optimization. And we're very lucky to also have him as one of our medical advisors to Maximus. So thank you, Dr. Shippen, for joining us today. Uh, this is great. Awesome. Well, I think you have a really, really interesting backstory. Um, I love to hear the story, in fact, of how you um, went from family practice to endocrinology. Uh, about age 50, uh, I tested myself because I was feeling really run down. Mm. I was gaining weight, blood pressure was going up. I had typical midlife spread uh, syndrome X. Mm. And uh, I did a testosterone level and it was 250. Mm. And I was kind of shocked mm. and did not know anything more than the average medical student on testosterone. They do not teach it as part of uh, any of the specialties except uh, endocrinology, slightly. Uh, urology, pretty much focused on male diseases, mm. not so much on replacement, at least back then. And so I started with just treating myself. And I, I started off by treating with uh, hormone injections. Mm -hmm. So I got a big shot in my butt by my wife mm -hmm. every two weeks. That was not, that was not fun, but mm -hmm. it made the biggest change mm -hmm. in my energy, my vitality, my mood, my memory. Uh, I had lost my initiative. I had a busy mm -hmm. practice that was going. Uh, almost 24 seven with a big practice. So uh, suddenly I had reserve and uh, my golf game had been slipping. <laughs> and that was important to me mm -hmm. because physically uh, I'm a pretty good athlete and I, mm -hmm. I was a good golfer, but I could tell I was just getting weaker. Yeah. With a testosterone, I had a, a major transformation in my health. And it was so shocking that I started reading up on everything I could. Mm -hmm. And I started testing my patients and lo and behold, my patients who had grown older with me, but I delivered their babies, now they're in their forties and fifties, having the same issues I was. Mm 
So I started testing them and wow, a lot of them were low. Mm -hmm. So then I started treating more and more men with testosterone and getting similar results. Uh, the shots every two weeks is kind of a traditional way of giving back then. Right. We didn't have uh, any of the products that are on the market now, the androgels and the various different uh, types. Uh, and I knew nothing about boosting testosterone, only about replacing. And that my knowledge in that was limited. So I joined the Andropause Society in England mm -hmm. and uh, they were into it. And all of their information was uh, on pellets with men and primarily, and then the Europeans also were into injections and they had an oral form mm -hmm. of testosterone decanoe. By the way, um, um, I, I think you brought up a really interesting word there, andropause. Uh, I think most of our viewers are familiar with, of course, menopause for women, but can you tell our viewers what andropause is for men? Uh, my introduction to andropause was actually through a French doctor. I uh, heard one of his lectures. He came to this country and gave a lecture on andropause. Mm. I think that's the first time I'd ever heard that term used. And he outlined the symptoms, the, uh, the range of uh, men that had it, which mm -hmm. was kind of shocking. Uh, he also brought up the subject of estrogen which I had never heard of with men. And so I started uh, to get interested in the subject of andropause and I called it that. Mm -hmm. Since that time, we've gotten away from that term. Mm. We now realize that males do not have a menopause. Mm -hmm. You know, age 40, 50, they don't just shut down and go into a low testosterone uh, like women do with estrogen. Right. Their ovaries fail around age 50, plus or minus some. But we don't have a, uh, a limit. There are many men that maintain high testosterone into their 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the term andropause, though, was a good way to view it, that some men were going through this transition, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. and needed hormone replacement just like women did. Mm. Now we're getting more sophisticated and we realize that low testosterone can be caused by many things mm. uh, besides aging. Right. And so it's not an age related decline. It's, it's something that is related to our lifestyle. It's uh, related to uh, some of the uh, estrogenic substances that are in our diet. We call mm -hmm. them xenoestrogens. Right. Uh, there's uh, a rising level of these estrogenic compounds uh, that are lowering testosterone in the population. So mm -hmm. interestingly, 20 years ago, the normal range for testosterone was quite a bit higher than it is today. Mm. So the population in general is being affected by environmental uh, things. There, Our lifestyles are completely changed, particularly with COVID. Everybody is mm -hmm. getting less active, they're get, right. gaining weight. And so the combination of xenoestrogens and lifestyle changes and stresses and just changes in the way we live, turn of the century, we walked to work. Yeah. We didn't even have cars. So, right. uh, you know, we had horse and buggies and we did a lot of walking. We, <laughs> we farmed by, by walking behind the animals and, mm -hmm. Uh, so we had a very different style of living and physical demands of living uh, by the turn of the century. Uh, now uh, we have cars, we have uh, our TVs, we have our mm -hmm. uh, cell phones. Uh, we live a, a much more uh, quiet life unless one goes out of their way to exercise. Right. Uh, so that combination of things... Uh, I started to recognize in my patients, some of them were gaining weight, some of them were uh, running low testosterone, and I could see that there were changes uh, that were related to other things that weren't what you would call an endocrinopathy itself, mm -hmm. like something that was caused by failing testicles or right. something wrong with their pituitary. Right. Yes, there were cases, and as I 
did more testing, I found some genetic cases. I found mm -hmm. uh, men that had uh, medical reasons for their low testosterone. Right. Uh, but the vast majority of men that I treated did not have endocrinopathies mm. in the classic sense. Uh, and I began to use something named clomiphene. Mm -hmm. I'd read about clomiphene and I started using clomiphene as a test right. for whether they had just declining levels due to some of the reasons that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So they were still intact, but they were underperforming uh, for these various reasons. And the clomiphene test uh, was great because it would override those issues and cause a rebound increase in testosterone mm -hmm. by upregulating the pituitary and the testicle axis with mm -hmm. clomiphene. So I started using a lot of clomiphene testing and, and lo and behold, I found a lot of men had this great boost in testosterone. I'd leave them on clomiphene. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to give them shots. Yeah. I, I also got very interested in old fashioned chorionic gonadotrophin. Mm -hmm. Now that's gotten kind of a bad rep because of people using it for weight loss mm -hmm. uh, for non-traditional uh, uses. Right. Uh, but HCG or chorionic anatotrophin has long been around for fertility, uh, for increasing sperm count and increasing low testosterone caused by a declining pituitary mm -hmm. uh, where the testicles are still intact, but they're not getting the signaling. And HCG overrides that and gives the signal back right. and restores levels to normal, much like clomiphene. So, so I, I have a lot of questions about clomiphene and HCG, so let's get into that. But before you, we do, I, I want to touch on a really important point that you brought up in terms of both lifestyle factors contributing to the decline in testosterone um, and associated sperm count. Um, but also the sort of these, uh, environmental endocrine disrupting chemicals. Do you have a sense of, of how much, I know it's hard to say, uh, is contributing like for instance, how many folks in your practice do you find are, are not seriously obese or sedentary and, and are still having uh, low testosterone? That's a, that's an excellent question. Um, I would say the most common reason is, mm -hmm. is stress, lack of activity and obesity. That interesting. That that particular category, the middle age spread, we've even got a uh, kind of a term for it that we kind of expect guys in their 40s to start to get big bellies and right. gain central fat mm -hmm. uh, due to those lifestyle things. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I would run into the what we call mesomorphic people, people that mm -hmm. are not fat, that are muscular, athletic uh, or thin. And there's no explanation for a low testosterone in these guys. Some of them were actually exercising and, and having a fairly good mm -hmm. uh, lifestyle. A lot of them go to the gym. A lot of them were athletic. Uh, and that really helped. But even despite that, uh, they would run low testosterone. Mm. Or we would run into the overtraining syndrome. Mm -hmm. Guys that wanted to get in shape and they started running. We back at that time was the jogging uh, aerobics. And so everyone was into doing aerobics and running. And then we got 10 Ks and marathon guys mm -hmm. and people training for marathons that were running these large amounts of, of mileage would get to a point where they had overstressed their pituitary testicular ac axis and they would mm -hmm. drop in their testosterone. Yeah. Fascinating. They, it's classic overtraining syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, the literature recognized that and found that clomiphene mm -hmm. uh, was a good treatment for that. Mm -hmm. If you put them on clomiphene, raise their testosterone, you could reverse the overtraining syndrome. Plus wow. with good doctoring, you get them into a better balance of diet and exercise. So they're not uh, exercising beyond their limits to try to gain their uh, peak performance at the expense of, uh, just training too much. Right. Um, so question on this, uh, uh, clomiphene or clomid has been around since 1967. Um, and it's obviously, uh, FDA approved for fertility in women. It's, it's not, uh, formally approved for, um, 
you know, treating men, although it's obviously been used off label for decades. Um, if it's, if it's so effective, why has it not become more popular and why is sort of TRT really like, uh, usually become the first line treatment? The first thing that I would say is there is no good training in medical care in any of the specialties for men's health. It's always men's diseases. Mm -hmm. Everything focuses on, okay, somebody that has uh, lost their testicles in an accident or radiation or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. They have a medical reason for it. And so replacing somebody that has primary hypogonadism mm -hmm. uh, is pretty much standard medicine. Mm -hmm. But when you get people that are running lower levels or borderline lower levels, even sometimes normal levels, mm -hmm. but having the symptom complex, nobody is teaching what to do to optimize mm. those people that are sliding down the scale, but haven't reached the end point where you can make that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So a lot of insurances don't even pay unless you can document that the testosterone is below that lab normal, not even the normal ranges by the societies, mm -hmm. which is actually much higher. Usually it's 300 to a thousand in most, uh, uh, most of the, uh, general uh, endocrine society things, but some labs, their normal goes down to 175 or 180 because they mm -hmm. are taking testosterone ranges in the quote, normal population. Mm -hmm. Well, who's in the normal population? A lot of sick guys. Right, right. So the normal range is not a healthy range, mm -hmm. but it's interpreted that way. And right. some doctors won't treat unless they're abnormal in that range by whatever lab they use. Right. The labs vary by two, 300, 500 points. I mean, it's all over the place. And so you have a lot of doctors afraid to treat unless they see lower levels. And because there's no training, just to give you an example, mm -hmm. in five years, there's been one lecture on hypergonadism at our local hospital. Wow. One, one hour lecture. Now, what are you going to learn in an hour right. on this complex sub so our uh, subject? But uh, so what are our residents getting? No mm -hmm. training whatsoever. Uh, so they go out, they become specialized, they're board certified, they're good docs. Mm -hmm. But that's a blank in their training. Right. And it's, it's among all specialties. I, I would fault the... Uh, Originally, the uh, urolo urology uh, guidelines, the endocrine guidelines became kind of just written up by ivory tower people. Mm -hmm. And they would post these guidelines and, and that's what doctors would kind of look to, but they didn't really understand them. Uh, as I started to treat people, I saw people that were still in the normal range. And by that, I mean, they could be 350 or 400. Mm -hmm. still in the normal range, but they have the classic symptoms of hypogonadism. Mm. And that involves energy and vitality. It involves mood. It involves libido, sexuality, strength, stamina, recovery from exercise, and the feeling of being a couch potato, no mm -hmm. energy at the end of the day. Right. And, and uh, instead of once a night's enough, it's once a month is enough. The yeah. libido would would really drop and the wives are complaining and the guys are saying, Hey, there's nothing wrong with me. It's just, you know, I've been working too hard That's or right. it's, they might recognize it as stress, but they didn't understand where it was coming mm -hmm. from. And those people still in the normal range, if I boosted them up mm -hmm. into the middle or high normal range, in many cases, all of that would disappear. So yeah. you couldn't classify them necessarily as, hypogonadism, mm -hmm. even though they had dropped within the normal range, they normally were seven, 800 people. Now they're running four 500 or right. 350. So they're running half of what their levels were when they were young and robust, right. uh, but they're not out of the normal range to get a diagnosis. So they're not being identified and treated. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I, I think this is why um, I think you and a lot of our other advisors say, you know, it's important to treat the symptoms, not the numbers. 
right? Because the numbers, to your point, can be very deceiving, especially if the, you know, the lab values are, you know, cutting off at the second and a half percentile, meaning, you know, uh, unfortunately, we have a sick care system that's uh, more in the business of denying care, unfortunately, than providing care. And so if you're excluding 97.5% of the population, just on the basis of one lab value, um, you know, you're not treating everyone who would, to your point, would benefit from treatment, or, you know, if their levels are originally high, but they're dropping, and they're still within the quote, unquote, normal range, um, they're symptomatic, but they don't necessarily qualify for treatment. Um, so I think that's a that's a really important point to emphasize. Um, I think a lot of um, guys associate, oh, I unless I have severely low testosterone, I shouldn't do anything about it, because that's what their primary care physicians say. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, that's become the status quo, even though in your clinical experience, people do benefit from, um, from whether it's low or even normal testosterone from being, uh, I guess, to where their potential could be. The, the interesting thing is science mm -hmm. looks at normal ranges on what we call a Gaussian distribution. Mm. That means there's a median level. And then there's standard deviations from the mean, so many percentage are above or below. And then one can look at the borderline low range. It's mm -hmm. really on a Gaussian distribution, it's only five to 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing 40% of the guys that are symptomatic mm -hmm. that are running uh, above that low normal, they're uh, at the median or below the median. And I know full well that they would have been in the percentile at the upper uh, standard deviations. So there's 10% of the people that need to be in that upper, upper quartile. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they're never recognized. Mm -hmm. The societies and all of the uh, guidelines kind of treat uh, the low normal as normal. Mm -hmm. And so if you fall into that, it doesn't matter whether that's abnormal for you. You're still not abnormal according to the guidelines. Right. And so there's lack of recognition of individual variation based on very simple Gaussian distribution of, of mm -hmm. endocrine factors. And that's true for all hormones. Right. So it sounds like, you know, focusing a lot more on symptoms and, and particularly if there's been a change in someone's functioning um, seems like a smarter and more individualized way of practicing um, medicine. Uh, on that note, I'd love to hear a little bit about your book. Um, tell, tell us what the testosterone syndrome is um, and, and what your, you know, your approach is to addressing it. After about five years of practice, I developed a pretty large practice of testosterone because nobody was treating it. And by mm -hmm. word of mouth, uh, I found that a higher and higher percentage of my patient uh, that were coming in were coming in for testosterone treatment. Mm -hmm. And I welcomed it because I, I love making people feel better. Of course. Uh, and I could see that I made a bigger difference in my paper, patient population for getting them healthy than any other thing that I could do for them. Mm -hmm. I could give them diets. I could put them on medicine for their blood pressure. I could treat their diabetes. I could do the normal things. They didn't get sure. better, better. Mm -hmm. But when I put them on testosterone, I see the same transformations that happen with me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, interestingly, uh, there was a writer that was doing uh, an article on testosterone. And mm -hmm. so he didn't know who to call. There weren't many experts out there. Mm -hmm. So he called one of the major compounding pharmacies in the country. And I happened to be using them for my topical testosterone. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you better call Dr. Shippen. He writes for more prescriptions than anybody in the country. Mm -hmm. And I said, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's, I'm just a country doctor here in Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. I'm writing for more than anybody else that they have in their, their group. And so they referred the writer to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said he wanted to write this article and outline the, uh, the spectrum of things that people see. And I said, I can help you with the article, but I think I have enough uh, patience and interesting cases to make a book of my own. Mm -hmm. He said, that sounds like a great idea. So mm -hmm. when we're done with the article, which he then got published as a chapter in somebody else's book, mm -hmm. uh, we started meeting on weekends 
And he was a good technical writer. He had written some of uh, the diet books uh, and bestsellers. I mean, this mm -hmm. was a, a good writer and he had a good grasp of science and, and health. Uh, and so on our weekends, he said, give me cases. And so I went into my files and I developed cases of, of different uh, types of problems. And so we outlined this in different chapters of the book. And we had a big chapter on estrogen. Mm. And nobody had talked about estrogen. Yeah. That was, uh, it sounds like that's a female hormone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yes, it's a female hormone, but it's a big male hormone. Mm. In fact, when you're deficient in testosterone, you're usually deficient in, in estrogen if your that's levels right. are going down. Unless, of course, you're gaining weight and generating too much estrogen. Mm. So too much or too little is unhealthy. In fact, that's one of the more important aspects of replacing or boosting testosterone is to bring estrogen back into the normal ranges. Mm. Uh, and so part of the book was on this estrogen issue. Mm -hmm. And it was the first book that mentioned estrogen. And I think because of that, because of that one chapter, my book got more traction in all the chat rooms. Mm -hmm. And I got invitations to speak at some of the health conferences. I got invited to England, to the Andropause Society that I mm -hmm. had joined. And I gave them a lecture on estrogen. They were very uh, supportive and they liked my lecture uh, enough that that kind of became the cornerstone of my expertise mm. was uh, Dr. Shippen talking about the estrogen side of the equation and how yeah. he handled it, managed it. But by the way, I think this would be really educational for our listeners. Um, I think, you know, guys, uh, you know, I'm actually surprised. Maybe it's because, uh, you know, you're, when you're a clinician, you, you assume everyone uh, knows more than they actually do. I think men associate testosterone as the male hormone, estrogen or estradiol as a female hormone. Um, but can you give a quick overview for our listeners in terms of, you know, what are, what are the functions of both of those in, in men? Um, uh, you know, besides obviously like, you know, uh, masculinizing and feminizing. The testosterone that circulates around your body uh, gets uh, rooted into strong testosterone called dihydrotestosterone. Mm -hmm. And that's gotten a lot of attention because it, it seems to be associated more with baldness. So mm. people don't like the too much dihydrotestosterone. And that, of course, is a misnomer. To the, the stronger testosterone is the most important mm -hmm. form of testosterone for sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, and for certain parts of the body are very dependent on the conversion of circulating testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. Mm -hmm. And then scattered around the body, in the blood vessels, in the uh, brain, in the nervous system, there are, uh, there's an enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase converts estrogen, testosterone into estrogen. So it's almost biblical that the mm -hmm. female is made from the male. That's right. And so male hormone goes on in both males and females to form the estrogen that they need. Uh, what they found is if somebody becomes deficient in testosterone, that they also are going to be deficient most of the time uh, if they run very low testosterone in mm -hmm. estrogen. Mm -hmm. And the side effects of low estrogen are increased cardiovascular disease, increase, increased insulin resistance. So they become more syndrome X or that central fat. They can't lose that. They sometimes gain a little bit of chest fat called gynecomastia. Mm -hmm. uh, but low low estrogen is actually associated with increased mortality from cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. So with men being, uh, having a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease as they age, lower estrogen is a problem for aging males, just as low testosterone is. Mm -hmm. uh, in that conversion, if you gain weight, your fat cells have more aromatase, you may get too much estrogen. Now, mm -hmm. Uh, on the high side, you become estrogen dominant and estrogen suppresses many of the sexual functions, uh, libido and, and weight gain and moodiness, 
Uh, men sometimes get teary at movies when their estrogen is too high. They get more right. emotional. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of kid with them. They need, they want to shop and chat instead of uh, <laughs> more, more active activities. But uh, so the issue is to find the optimal balance of mm-hmm. testosterone and estrogen. Right. And so the assessment is important that you measure both of those hormones to mm-hmm. see if there's an imbalance. Are you estrogen dominant, testosterone low? Well, you have to mm-hmm. correct that. Uh, are you low testosterone and low estrogen? Well, you have mm-hmm. to correct that. And so there are different approaches to replacement or boosting mm-hmm. that solve those different problems. So it sounds like with es- uh, estrogen, and there's almost like a Goldilocks zone, if you will, not not too low, not too high. Um, is there an objective, like, was there a, a range that you're shooting for therapeutically to get men into the optimal range? And then conversely, is there a similar thing for testosterone or or is it different in the sense that there's no problem with being high testosterone? What has, what started as a concept of kind of an estrogen testosterone ratio Mm -hmm. in my book, I kind of talked about the ratio being five to one or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you were more than that, uh, you had a higher level of estrogen to testosterone, you were high estrogen. Uh, what I've come to find out is that genetically, we have a wide range of variation. And so I've gotten away from uh, trying to define a ratio as being good or bad. Mm. I find some men have high estrogen mm-hmm. uh, and they're asymptomatic. They don't have gynecomastia, they have good libido, they're fine. Uh, And treating them, they feel worse. Mm. So they're born with a higher estrogen component Mm -hmm. genetically. So we have to really individualize endocrinology of men Mm -hmm. and not just look at, at a certain ratio. People wanna say, oh, well, when you're 20, your ratio is all testosterone, almost no estrogen. Mm. Wrong. Uh, it's, it's different for every person. So mm-hmm. the skill of the physician is to find out through trial and error. Some, sometimes the testing starts us off thinking that the ratio is off. And we find that uh, as we treat testosterone and estrogen rises, there seems to be no bad uh, side effects. In fact, mm-hmm lipids get better and cardiovascular risk factors get better, insulin sensitivity gets better. I don't treat those because uh, of a number. Right. And so we've gotten a little bit away from just specific numbers, specific ratios and tried yeah. to look at what, uh, unfortunately we don't have long-term data from when people were in their twenties or thirties. We right. have only the data in their forties, fifties, sixties. So, right. um, I've kind of come to the conclusion that that's the art of medicine. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. the art of endocrinology. And that's really what excites me about this group is we are using now uh, experts from every division in medicine, from endocrinology, Mm -hmm. from internal medicine, from urology. Mm -hmm. And we're bringing all of the best of those specialties together for those different points. And I think that because of cross-pollination, all of us are becoming better at treating men Mm -hmm. uh, by understanding the individuality and uh, the individual balancing that's required to, sometimes through trial and error, in Mm -hmm. treating men long-term. Yeah, it's such a great point about personalized medicine. You know, we always talk about that being the future, and I think we're we're at the forefront of that. Um, and I think you also shared a really important point about you know testosterone converting to um, estrogen through um, aromatase. And unfortunately, people have a very simplistic view of testosterone good, estrogen bad for for men, which is obviously to your point an oversimplification. Um, I guess a question I have is um, one of the things that people know when they um, uh, do a therapeutic regimen that, that particularly one that stimulates their own natural testosterone production is their testosterone increases and usually their estrogen increases concomitantly. 
So they might see, for instance, a doubling of their testosterone, a doubling of their estrogen levels. So the ratio will stay very similar or the same. Um, is that in, is that problematic in any way? Uh, you know, you pay attention to the positives and the negatives. Mm. So one thing I learned was more is not better. Mm. In other words, being high normal, everyone wants to be in the upper tertiary of, of testosterone. They want to be the alpha male. They want to have their testosterone at or even above the normal range. They want that extra mm -hmm. benefit. And, and men that are into bodybuilding, weight, weight uh, you can see that some of those guys are very unnaturally sure. uh, yeah. configured. Their muscles are way bigger than anybody else. They have no body fat. You can see all the veins and arteries. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of a characteristic in their competitions is sure. see who can be the leanest, the meanest. And if you right. look at the testosterone levels that these guys are taking to get that, mm -hmm. uh, they're bad. They're bad mm -hmm. levels because they do make those differences. But before long, those guys find that what was a very high raging libido is now normal or low libido or no right. libido. Right. And now they've turned off uh, many of the receptors, the hormone receptors, as they flood the system and desensitize mm -hmm. with excessive hormone. The body has to regulate itself right. uh, if it's getting too much of one compound or another. And that's true of every hormone, too much thyroid, too much cortisone. You hear bad things about all of those. So I don't know of any hormone that is healthier when it's above the normal range. Right. Does that, uh, that downregulation issue, is that, a, is that true if, it, if you're still within the normal range? Like if you're below 1,000 in total testosterone or below, let's say, 200 in free testosterone, is there a risk of downregulation or lo long-term adverse consequences? You'll, you'll see it, yes. And so this expectation of a normal range and guys saying, well, I, I want to be in the high normal range or they get to the higher normal range and they feel a whole lot better at first. Now they want to hold on to that. And you will find after six or eight weeks or a couple of months that they no longer have that same lift, that same energy profile, that same libido profile. And they're now saying, well, you know, for the first two or three months, I was feeling like, I was 16 again. Mm -hmm. And now I don't know what happened, but my libido is flat. And yes, they're getting the anabolic effects of testosterone. They're feeling stronger. But the other benefits of diverse feeling good in all of those areas starts to uh, become impaired in other areas. So as you follow someone on replacement and you mm -hmm. see that happening, uh, the knee jerk is to raise the testosterone. Right. Oh, well, you don't have enough, so let's go higher. Mm. And higher doesn't make them better. And then yeah. you find out. Uh, and I found this out with the shots. Uh, the shots peak and, and valley over, over two or three weeks in the mm -hmm. kind of old fashioned traditional way. And I would have guys saying, you know, when you first give me the shot, I get, I get a lift. And then I kind of flatten out in between. And then I'm ready for my next shot. And lo and behold, my libido's raging. Yeah. As they get back into their normal range, their body starts working better. Right. So yes, the normal range is not a normative range uh, for everyone. The normal range has to be individualized on that, that Gaussian distribution. Some mm -hmm. guys are going to be normal at 450 and abnormally high at 800. And yeah. you run into that. That's such a great point. It sounds like everyone everyone has their own normal range is the takeaway that I, I get from um, you know what you're sharing, and I think that's a great point. So even even at Maximus, you know we have like eight different dosages, in fact, right? Uh, which is quite a quite a spread versus you know um, I think the initial like sort of V1 of telemedicine companies gave everyone the same you know 25 milligrams of Viagra. <laughs> There's no no personalization uh, in in the medicine, but I think that's really critical, especially when you're talking about hormones. 
Um, also, you, you, you started to mention shots, and I, 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 this is a, maybe an opportune time to talk about the difference between testosterone replacement versus testosterone uh, restoration, optimization, maximization, whatever you want to call it. Um, cause I think there's a lot of confusion. You know, one of the things I've observed on social media is many men now basically assume TRT is the only thing that works and everything else is worthless. That that's com the common trope, if you will. And maybe that's because there's so many like over the counter supplements that don't really do anything. And so maybe people have become skeptical of snake oil, but can you explain to our audience what the difference is between TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, and this testosterone, um, you know, restoration using CIRM, selective estrogen receptor modulators like uh, clomiphene and n clomiphene. The uh, the learning curve for me was long, uh, mm -hmm. so I started my practice on replacement. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any different. Yeah, and so a lot of what I was telling you about the shots wearing off were in the early days of practice when that's all I did. That's all we had was testosterone, cypion aid, and amphate injections. Uh, then the topical came out. So the book was written just as Androgel was being released. Mm -hmm. It was also written right around the time that Viagra hit the mm -hmm. books. And so now we're talking about maximal, uh, maximal androgen effects and maximal sexuality. Wow, this is, this is hormone heaven for these mm -hmm. guys. Right. And so the male psyche in general has the feeling that more is better. Of course. Uh, I mean, this, this is part of our makeup mm -hmm. and it's, it's true almost of all of the pleasure seeking things that we do. If a little is good, more is going to be more <laughs> fun, more, right. uh, more feedback. And so it extends beyond testosterone, but it hangs over. Uh, into the concept, well, I want to be that alpha male. I, I might not have been an alpha male. Maybe I was mm. a, a little more like a, an accountant. Right. Nothing that I have against accountants, but sure. these guys live sedentary lives as opposed to a bricklayer. Right. Uh, so it's, it's psychologically uh, important to understand and have the patient understand that we are going to find the optimal level for your genetic background mm -hmm. uh, that will make you feel good and be the healthiest mm -hmm. over the long term. And you couldn't achieve that as well with replacement in mm -hmm. young, younger, healthy males because yeah. you're always overshooting. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that happens, of course, is when you replace testosterone, everything shuts down. Mm -hmm. So your body's relying on the shot and it turns your testicles off. It turns your pituitary off. And now uh, it's uh, you're going to run into lower sperm counts. If you're wanting to have a baby, you're going to uh, run into testicles that are atrophy. They mm -hmm. say, Oh, what happened to the boys? They, they seem to be gone or, right. or they're, they're hardly there. They don't like that. Yeah. Uh, and so when you replace, you shut down. Mm -hmm. And when I started using the clomiphene test and clomiphene treatment, I found a lot of guys would stay on the clomiphene and feel better for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Not only that, I got no testicular atrophy. Not only that, my sperm count uh, was always good. And so I had no infertility problems. Mm -hmm. Same thing with HCG. Uh, I found that HCG... Uh, was giving great sperm counts. In fact, I, I had an older guy that got remarried to a young chick mm -hmm. and he had already had kids, so he wasn't very interested, but he's in his 60s mm -hmm. and he marries this, 40, this early 40s gal and she said, I'm running out of time. I think I want to have a baby now with, mm -hmm. with our new marriage. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, we better do a sperm count to see how your testosterone and your... your um, and his testosterone is low, so I put him on HCG. Mm -hmm. And on HCG, which is the LH from the pituitary, it's an analog of that. Right. Uh, and I got the sperm count back, and the person reading the sperm count at a fertility clinic, the comment on the report was, best I ever saw. <laughs> and 
he went on to father a child. Then I found out that if you gave HCG that would provide a little bit of uh, LH along with replacement, right. you could give replacement and not get testicular atrophy. So then the combination of replacement and then HCG was uh, a good uh, a good replacement. Yeah. Uh, and everyone that wanted to have a baby was able to have a baby with that combination. Right. With clomiphene, I never ran into that. Obviously, right. I was able to give clomiphene, restore levels to normal, didn't have any shots. I didn't have any complications of, of daily, weekly shots, measuring levels and all of that. You have following your hormone levels and your questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And so your, your clinical response, your, your testicular response and levels of testosterone, estradiol, that's what guided dosing. And we didn't have the problems that you run into with shutting down the, the whole uh, we call it the HP axis, the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis. Mm -hmm. So the brain and the pituitary are sensing the testosterone, the testicles are responding to the signals to make more mm -hmm. uh, if you're low. And that gets wiped out with replacement. Right. So just as you were saying, you know, it's, it's easy to overshoot with TRT, um, uh, especially in healthy young men. Um, I, I've heard something similar about clomiphene, right? That um, especially on very high doses um, for for guys, they can overshoot the sort of their estrogen, and sometimes they run into side effects, uh, especially um, visual ocular issues, uh, and more commonly mood and libido uh, issues. Uh, even though their testosterone is sky high, uh, there so is their estrogen. That's uh, almost super physiological, um, if you will. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about that and, and also what the difference is between clomiphene and N-clomiphene, which a lot of folks aren't as familiar with? Uh, the group of drugs that clomiphene belongs to are called SERMs, S-E-R-M-S, that they're chemicals that have a similar effect, uh, to hormones, but they're not hormones. And there's a big category of those, so I won't be too technical in that. Clomiphene belongs to the serum category. Mm -hmm. So it is actually an estrogen analog, but instead of activating estrogen receptors, it turns them off. Mm. So the as we were talking about the HP axis, the brain senses the circulating testosterone and in the brain, it converts testosterone into estrogen. Mm -hmm. And by the amount of estrogen in the brain, it decides whether there's enough testosterone. Mm -hmm. Well, when you give a serum that blocks estrogen receptors, you're fooling the brain into thinking there's not much testosterone. And mm -hmm. so there's a, an increased production of LH and FSH from the pituitary to make up for the difference. Mm -hmm. So we get a natural increase in signaling to the testicles to make more testosterone. Mm -hmm. Now, the other parts of the brain, the area in front of the HP axis is where your sexual centers are. Mm -hmm. And the sexual centers also require estrogen conversion. Mm -hmm. And so the serums that block estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus also can, if they're too high, start to block the estrogen receptors in the libido areas. Mm -hmm. So too much of the clomiphene or unclomiphene will actually downregulate the good estrogen receptors uh, by just blocking them. So there's an optimal level where you increase the testosterone and you get more testosterone estrogen conversion enough to override the slight suppression from the serum. Mm -hmm. Now, clomiphene is actually a combination of something we call isomers. Mm -hmm. Isomers are similar structural molecules, but they're like the right and left hand. Right. Uh, what we've found is that certain molecules that are right-handed are the active portion of the serum. And the left-handed uh, has a similar structure, but it doesn't fit the receptors the same way. So unfortunately, clomiphene has a predominance of the left-handed receptor. 
or the left-handed molecule that, that blocks the receptor. Uh, and so clomiphene is made of N-clomiphene as the right hand or active and zooclomiphene, which is the left hand. And because as you increase clomiphene, you're increasing zooclomiphene, there's a more narrow window for uh, that blocking effect. And so uh, clomiphene is actually harder to regulate because of the increasing zooclomiphene as you get to higher levels. So if you read the old literature, they gave clomiphene 50, 100 milligrams. And yeah, you got a, a great kick in testosterone. But as I was telling, as you get too much of one or too much blocking, pretty soon the patient is telling you, well, you know, I feel stronger, but libido is, is gone, or I'm weeping at the movies, or right. uh, I'm wanting to shop and chat, knowing that you're really becoming estrogen deficient. Uh, yeah. You can almost get uh, menopausal symptoms with hot flashes. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a very fine uh, adjustment that needs to be made in each individual. And the nice thing about clomiphene, it's the right-handed molecule. So we're going to get more stimulation without block, without as much blocking the zoo right. clomiphene. So it's a more purified form of the drug. And it has a wider range of, I don't want to call it safety, of right. efficacy. Right. Uh, at the same time, we're, we can give too much n clomiphene and run into the blocking of the hypothalamus in, this, in the libido areas. And then some of the side effects, visual side effects that uh, are sometimes reported just from that imbalance. Right. This is a really subtle, but really, really important point, right? So um, the two isomers, the left and right hands that you mentioned, right? So the clomiphene or clomid is 62% uh, N-clomiphene and 38% zooclomiphene. But the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is um, the half-lives are very different. The half-life of N-clomiphene is actually pretty short. The half-life of zooclomiphene is very long. And so what happens over time is when you take it, a lot of people feel great on Clomid uh, within the first week or so because they're getting more of the enclomiphene. But what happens over the weeks and months is uh, the enclomiphene stays very low. The zooclomiphene builds over time. So over time, I actually argue clomiphene is really zooclomiphene. You're pretty much getting 90% uh, uh, serum saturation levels of zooclomiphene versus enclomiphene, which is 99 point, you know, whatever percent pure. Um, you're really getting the enclomiphene molecules. So even though they're, they're, they're similar drugs on paper over time, they almost become two different drugs and have different effects because enclomiphene is more of an estrogen receptor antagonist and zooclomiphene is more of a, uh, a, an estrogen receptor agonist. Actually, it's more estrogenic. Um, and so, uh, I think that's the great promise of enclomiphene is you, you, to your point, you get this greater efficacy profile, um, potentially safety profile as well, um, in terms of the ability to boost testosterone without, um, as much of the, the risks or side effects. So uh, uh, on that note, can you talk a little bit about the efficacy and safety of n specifically, um, whether that's based on your reading of the research literature, or um, I know you've used it in your clinical practice as well. So I'm, I'm curious how that turns out for your patients. Uh, it's fairly new to my practice because the company that patented it, uh, held the patents originally with the idea that they were coming out with a drug mm -hmm. that would hit the market. And then for a number of reasons, they decided not to go forward with the uh, production as a, as a drug. So they vacated the patent, so to speak. And mm -hmm. once you vacate a patent, uh, other people can use it for the benefit of mankind. Mm -hmm. So you can't hold a patent and not act on it without other people having, finally having access to uh, the beneficial effects. And so that's what happened. And then clomiphene and clomiphene could be obtained in its uh, generic form and compounded uh, into various different strengths. Mm -hmm. And really with clomiphene itself, I used only, only the compounded clomiphene because I found just as you were talking about, if you stuck with the 50 milligram doses, 
uh, is a standard dose, you'd run into the problems that you were talking about. Um, and so very quickly, I learned that probably I've, not many people would I go above 25 milligrams and many people I would take the dose down to 10 or 15 milligrams and I've got good results. And I also found that giving a drug holiday would allow that buildup, which I didn't understand why, but just that you needed a breather from clomiphene to let the zooclomiphene get out of the system and for right. the receptors to become more sensitive, then it would work again. Mm -hmm. Well, then when n clomiphene came out, uh, it was much more powerful because 25 milligrams of n clomiphene were more like 50 milligrams of regular clomiphene. Right. So I found that because of its potency, you could get by with much lower doses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started lowering the dose to 10 and 15 milligrams and occasionally even less uh, and getting good results. And mm -hmm. the lower the dose, the lower the interference, mm -hmm. but obviously the higher the dose, the higher the effect on LH and testosterone levels. Right. And so there's a, a balance between the optimal dose of boosting the optimal dose of testosterone and estrogen. And that's, again, the art of medicine. More is not always better. Right. Yeah, and that's why, you know, in our protocol, um, which uh, great advisors like you have helped um, write, we start folks out at actually quite a low dose. It's 6.25 milligrams of enclomiphene, which is equivalent to about 10 milligrams of clomiphene or clomid. Um, and we find that, especially for generally healthier men, um, that... Uh, doubles their free testosterone levels. So it's actually quite potent. Um, and, and obviously our philosophy is start low and slow, so to speak, in terms of minimize any risk of side effects. We can always double the dose. We can, you can increase it to 12 and a half, 25 milligrams if people need a greater boost. But to your point, because of the, the, the need for individualization, it's better to start kind of a, a smaller, uh, smaller dosages and kind of work, work our way up. Um, on that note, I'm curious, um, you know, uh, in your experience in using it, um, what are some of the benefits? Like when a patient takes in clomiphene, what do they report in terms of um, how they feel? Um, it's obviously not as psychoactive as a drug um, as, as like a, you know, like an amphetamine in terms of uh, energy levels. But I'm, I'm curious what the subjective self-report is of your patients. You know, the first thing I ask them mm -hmm what's the difference in early morning erections? Mm -hmm. And early morning erections are, have nothing to do with sex. Mm. They are reflex erections that happen normally in men. And that's why the early morning wood uh, concept, people that have normal functioning testosterone, that's one of the basic questions. Mm -hmm. You wake up uh, periodically with a very good, sometimes rock hard erection. Right. Uh, and that's also one of the key symptoms of declining testosterone is mm -hmm. the loss of early morning wood. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're talking about sex, sexuality, libido, uh, you're talking about a very complex issue that has relationship issues, that has psychological issues. And yes, yeah, somebody can say, well, uh, they're expecting that as their testosterone goes up, they get a little more libido that become sexual animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet they're getting more out of it because of the, the anticipation. Mm -hmm. uh, the placebo effect is actually part of the total effect of the drug that you're giving. Fair enough, yeah, it's true uh, for all drugs. Early morning erections are free of any psychological aspect. Mm -hmm. So I like to use as one question, Mm -hmm. What's happened to early morning wood? And the guys that I'm treating almost all have said, you know, that's the thing of the past. I, I really, well, I might occasionally have one, but they weren't like they were when I was in my thirties. Right. Uh, you know, I'd roll over in the bed almost every morning and, you know, there he was. <laughs> uh, now it's, you know, it's a thing of the past. Now, when you go into uh, the boosting, that comes back. Mm -hmm. And so, that's a good objective criterion as opposed to some of the softer uh, psychological infused questions like how is your libido? How frequently do you have sex? Things like that, because that really 
has a lot to do with your psychological expectations as much sure. as the physiology. That's such a great uh, little uh, tip or trick, I would say, right? I think um, a, a, lot, a lot of guys might have heard about sort of this concept of early morning wood or, uh, you know, a, a, a spontaneous erection upon waking, so to speak, um, but may not pay attention to it. But maybe it's a good, you know, canary in the coal mine or bellwether of, uh, you know, I think a lot of folks listening to this podcast may be asking themselves, well, is my testosterone level optimal or not? You know, obviously the best way is to check your levels. Um, but short of that, you know, as we talked about, you know, the symptoms That's an are excellent important. biomarker of declining levels is a change in that little uh, thing. And it's not something that anybody pays attention to mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's not useful. Right. And so whether you have it or don't have it, it's not going to change your day. Right. Uh, and if you go to use it, it, it disappears, you know, yeah. so it's not something that if it happens, you can jump up and be active. As soon as you jump up and be active, it goes away. Totally. Uh, and you have to rely on, on normal activity. The other question that uh, is very good is how's your afternoon and evening energy? Mm. Do you now have energy for more things late in the day than you used to? Mm -hmm. And the term couch potato comes from people that get home from work and they work hard. And basically they grab a beer and sit down on the couch mm -hmm. and they start watching the ball game or news or whatever they like to watch. Uh, they may not even have energy to read. And uh, so the energy late in the day is another biomarker of a better testosterone activity. Mm -hmm. What do guys do when their testosterone is fine? They get home and they start mowing the lawn and they start doing the, the uh, honeydews that are out and uh, those have disappeared. They, the honey asks you to do something when your testosterone is low and you're on the couch saying, well, not right now. I've got to, I've got to catch it, catch my nap right. or uh, I'm just not up for it today. Uh, and so that disappears and their activities later in the day, their non-business activities increase. So that's another kind of a general thing that they'll notice that mm -hmm. their energy stays good and they're automatically more energized to mm -hmm. be active. Right. Uh, so I like to use that. And uh, obviously we talk about how good are your erections? How often mm -hmm. are you uh, experiencing uh, satisfactory intercourse and, uh, and those kind of things because they do go up. Uh, but that, area of questioning, if you look at the literature on that, mm -hmm. it's all over the place because those biomarkers are 50% psychological and 50% physiological, or maybe right. even 90% and 10% or, or some other uh, ratio. Right. So you can't use those all the time, but basic energy, vitality, reserve, initiative, initiative for doing mm -hmm. extra things. Uh, early morning erections. Those are some of the, the key things that I am interested in when I have a patient coming back for follow-up. Mm -hmm. That's such a great point too, because I, I think um, uh, people anecdotally just associate um, testosterone, higher testosterone with kind of bodybuilding, right? The, the effects on uh, body composition in terms of uh, decreasing um, body fat, increasing muscle mass. But I think they underappreciate um, and the the boost in energy, um, and it's a very different type of energy than um, you know the stimulants. I, like uh, just a personal example, I can't tolerate stimulants. I can't tolerate caffeine or any of those things. It makes me anxious, jittery. So I, I don't like using any of those. But I notice that when my testosterone levels are optimal, my energy levels it's a it's a much it's almost like a calm energy uh, is the way that I put it. Um, uh, testosterone is often described as the hormone that makes effort feel good. Right. So hard work doesn't feel so hard, uh, so to speak. Um, and so I think for a lot of folks who are listening out there who are tired and, and sick, uh, sick and tired of being tired, um, you know, uh, testosterone uh, optimization may be something that's particularly uh, beneficial to look at. So you said something very, for, very important there, and that is the feel good. Mm -hmm. And so energy from a stimulant may make you feel jazzy and energetic, uh, but testosterone, when it's up, increases mood. And there's plenty of studies on mm. depression 
that show that low testosterone is associated with higher levels of depression, anxiety. And so in a way, I almost call testosterone a happiness hormone because mm -hmm. if you're feeling better and more energetic, it's, it's good feeling energy. It's, right. It makes you feel better uh, in general. It, it's a global positive in how you feel and function. So that's another soft sign, but it's very important that, that that's asked along with the rest of the questions. How are you feeling uh, as far as your positive energy? Do you feel more up? Do you feel uh, more positive about your job, more positive about your family affairs? Uh, so it's a positive energy at the end of the day or all during the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So not only is it increasing their energy or, or arousal, as we call it in psychology, but the, the valence in terms of the positivity of the mood as well. Interestingly, um, in our clinical trial, we actually um, gave a, a, a standardized uh, measure of mood, the PHQ-4, um, which is two questions about depression, two questions about anxiety. Um, uh, and 56% of our participants actually reported an improvement um, in, uh, anxiety and depression symptoms, even though it's not a, it's not a psychiatric treatment. Um, but, uh, to your point, if it's almost like the happiness hormone, um, it does seem to have some, some mood, uh, mood boosting effects. Um, which is why I'm actually very excited about sort of the, the, the future of like neuroendocrinology, if you will, you know, psychiatric drugs have been so focused on specific neurotransmitters, whether it's serotonin or dopamine, et cetera. We, we, I think we've come to realize that the single monoamine hypothesis of depression is caused by low serotonin or ADHD is caused by low dopamine is, is oversimplified, so to speak. Um, and, and maybe there'll be, you know, uh, more treatments that are actually hormonal in nature to improve mood. Yeah, the other area is uh, in, uh, in your physical uh, changes. And that mm -hmm. means uh, you're able to burn fat more easily. Guys that are pre-diabetic, guys mm -hmm. that have insulin sensitivity, what we call syndrome X is a complex of findings of low, uh, of increased insulin resistance and insensitivity, which causes central weight gain and kind of a change in the distribution of muscle to fat. Mm -hmm. uh, and exercise uh, capacity, exercise tolerance, the desire to exercise. You know, guys that have syndrome X, you tell them to exercise and, uh, you know, work out and diet, they fail mm. because they don't have the energy to do it. Right. Oh, they get started. They, they pay a lot for the gym. They get a trainer. And how long does that last? Well, it might last two months. And then they're not showing up or they fire the trainer mm. or they find it's inconvenient. And pretty soon they're dropping off. They're wasting their money dropping off the program. Guys with high testosterone are seeing the results. Uh, their tone and muscular capacity is going up. Their mm -hmm. desire to exercise increases with that. Yeah. And so they get positive feedback from their trainer or from their workouts. And uh, they tend to stay with it uh, a lot longer and get much better results. And physically, you can just ask them, uh, has your belt not gone in? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if your weight didn't change much. Why doesn't it change much when you're working out? Well, that's because muscle weighs more than fat. Mm -hmm. And so they may weigh the same, but their fat muscle ratio has changed. Mm -hmm. And you can say, yes, my belt has gone into two notches, but my weight's only down five pounds. I, I don't understand why I'm not losing more weight. Well, sir, you're, you're building a lot more muscle. What, what weight you have now is healthier weight. Yeah. That's such a great point too. So not only does a uh, higher testosterone get, help you get more out of an exercise or training regimen, but you, you brought up a really important subtle point about it makes your desire to go to the gym, which is so hard for all of us, right? Uh, easier to do. Cause you know, I, I hear from a lot of people, they're like, oh, well, you know, you should always just treat testosterone naturally, so to speak by diet, exercise, et cetera. And one of the points I always bring up is yes, that's optimal. Unfortunately, that doesn't apply to 80% of people. But even for those people, we're obviously, you know, we believe in behavior change. In fact, coaching is part of um, the Maximus protocol. 
uh, you know, we find that when you increase testosterone, the desire to go and do health behavior change, whether it's fix your diet, exercise, your sleep, um, people are just much more on point uh, with their health behavior regimen. So it's really synergistic, the, the behaviorism and the, the pharmacology. Yeah, I call it initiative. That's, mm -hmm. it's a, there's, there's more initiation of other activities. There's more sustenance of positive uh, of positive habits because you feel better doing them, but you also feel like doing them. And right. there's a difference. So, um, yeah, testosterone, when I first started using it and I started seeing the changes in people, uh, they were dynamic health changes that I wasn't getting by just giving medication. Right. So what I would do to treat somebody with insulin resistance would be put them on diabetic drugs. Mm -hmm. In fact, they might be borderline diabetic or even mildly diabetic and require diabetes pills. Some of the pills uh, that we had initially uh, were drugs that increase the amount of insulin that you produce. Mm -hmm. And the failing insulin or the insulin resistance is not that they're diabetic because they don't produce insulin. It's diabetic because the insulin doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I found out was when I started a diabetic on testosterone, I had to lower their diabetic drugs or they would start to get hypoglycemia from the mm -hmm. excess of insulin. Interesting. So there's some physiologic changes that occur where you're now able to get by on less medicine, which is mm -hmm just a, a medically a great thing. The fewer medicines, the more you can do with lifestyle, uh, much better outcomes than can just getting people healthier with a pill. Right. So you, you mentioned a couple of, um, of the, the key benefits of having optimal testosterone levels, uh, a restoration of morning erections in wood, uh, and an increase in energy, and as you call it, initiative, um, an improvement in mood, um, and, and often even a desire to do uh, health behaviors like exercise. Um, let's talk also actually about libido and sex drive um, as well, even though it has both a psychological and a physiological component. Um, the, the reason I wanted to bring it up is because, you know, um, there's been a proliferation of the PDE5 inhibitors, right? The syndalophils, the Viagras of the world, and the tadalophils, the Cialis of the world. Um, and I think a lot of men are confused about what these uh, ED drugs, so to speak, do. Um, in terms of increasing blood flow and obviously the ability to um, get an erection, they're great for, for that, but they don't necessarily increase uh, sexual drive or libido or the enjoyment of sex. Um, so can you talk about the difference between like the ED drugs and, and testosterone if you're looking to improve your libido or sex drive? Uh, as I said, libido is a complex mm -hmm. uh, group of variables. Now, you can get low libido from lack of activity. In other words, if you go on a mission uh, where they're all guys that are doing positive things for the world, but there's, there's no outlet, mm -hmm. uh, libido will drop during that time because uh, there's no sexual outlet. And so the body can downregulate that. And libido will start coming back when they're anticipating leave to get home to their honeys. Mm -hmm. So there are some physiologic changes that are situational. The other thing is there may be a decrease in uh, attempts if they're having power failures. Who, who wants to initiate something that's going to have a high failure rate? Fair and enough. so yeah. guys avoid it uh, or cancel their libido feelings because they don't want to disappoint. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, the Viagra can guarantee more success mm -hmm. if you're healthy and it can increase that kind of libido. Mm -hmm. But if your testosterone is low, uh, your sexual thoughts are not as high. Your drive is not as high. Uh, initiative, what I was talking about for other things also includes initiative in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. So as testosterone goes up, those thoughts and feelings, dreams, uh, thinking about it all the time. I mean, when we were young, it was reported that we would have a sexual thought every 30 seconds or <laughs> every minute or two. 
And so it was a little disruptive when we were teenagers. And then it kind of leveled off to, okay, we get a stable relationship. And mm -hmm. now you have a rhythm within that relationship of that's based upon uh, mutual desires. Uh, and then testosterone comes along and starts to decline. And half of the equation, the male half, sure. starts to uh, back off. And that may create relationship problems in, in and of itself because expectations are not being met. Mm -hmm. That creates crises in the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can feed libido. So, I mean, it's, it's a very complex subject. The nice thing is when natural libido comes back up, mood comes back up, initiative comes back up, and the positive feelings that you get toward your mate are all tied up in that. And so you get a recruitment of all of these positive factors coming together that you don't just get with uh, Viagra, for example, that right. just gives you a better performance. Mm -hmm. uh, the two together are great. Now you have more confidence and you have more drive and it builds on itself. Absolutely. Um, so you talked about the benefits in the bedroom. I'm curious about the benefits in the boardroom, so to speak, um, in terms of, you know, I think a lot of guys, in addition to the energy slump that you mentioned, which can be remediated through testosterone optimization, are looking for improvements in their focus, in terms of their concentration and in terms of their performance, not just in the bedroom and in the gym, but but in at work, uh, in order to be competitive and and move along in terms of their professional development, I'm curious what you've observed when um, your patients have optimized their testosterone in terms of the the professional and work benefits. Um, you know, I don't think I spend much time on that issue when I'm face to face. That yeah. That doesn't come up very often, mm. uh, but I can tell you initiative, that, yeah. that word applies to all those areas. Yeah. Initiative for uh, completing your work mm -hmm. or initiative for doing the extra, going the extra mile at work is, yeah. is the same initiative you get when you get home and have the honeydews or just want to do other activities. Right. Um, so, I'm sure that that bridges into yeah. uh, more positive, maybe more dominant activity. Yeah. You may have been a type A dominant male type when your mm -hmm. testosterone was normal and you get to be a little more type B, a little bit more accepting, a little bit more let somebody else do the job, a little more of a follower than a leader. Um, and. Uh, I am certain that if you were a type A, you'll start to see the type A behaviors uh, returning with that and better job performance and just more energy for the job is going to give you uh, more, uh, more work energy and positive uh, outcomes. Absolutely. Have you noticed anecdotally anything in terms of attentional benefits? I, I mentioned this because we had a, a, a patient who incidentally uh, has ADHD um, and went on our protocol, uh, not for that, but, uh, you know, to optimize his testosterone and incidentally reported an improvement in his attention. It was kind of an interesting, you know, uh, uh, serendipitous kind of finding. I'm, I'm curious if you've heard that from other folks as well. Well, think of the physiology. When when your testosterone comes up, your dopamine system is more active. Mm. And the key aspect of ADHD is low dopamine levels. Also, certain types of depression are more low dopamine. They talk about serotonin. They talk about norepinephrine. But I'll tell you what, dopamine is right there. And not too many of the antidepressants deal with dopamine mm -hmm. or adequate enough. So they get a boost in the other things, but not the dopamine. When testosterone comes along, dopamine goes up. And that means that their ADHD uh, is not being created by a low dopamine environment in the, in the brain. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point about the association between testosterone um, and dopamine. Um, and that these two often go sort of hand in hand. And so when you optimize one, you can potentially optimize the other. So I think this is a really um, important emerging area for research. 
Um, I wanted to ask uh, common questions that, that folks ask about our, our protocol. I think most men have a positive association with testosterone. Um, to your point, more is not always better, but they know that it's important for their you know, optimal functioning. Um, I think what scares some folks off is this idea of if I have higher testosterone, um, it's going to uh, accelerate my hair loss. Or if I have higher testosterone, it's going to uh, increase my prostate growth or, or give me prostate cancer or cardiovascular disease, uh, or cut my life short in some way. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about the research on that? Yeah, un unfortunately, uh, there have been some lousy articles written on testosterone replacement mm -hmm. uh, that reported increased cardiovascular events within the right. first 90 days. Uh, when they were examined carefully, uh, some of these studies in reputable journals uh, have been totally just, I mean, you looked at the research and it was poorly done mm. uh, based on statistical. Uh, one study, the, the baseline uh, variables showed an improvement, but when they got through with all their statistical analyses, there was a, a decrease. Mm. Uh, what I like to see is the uh, mortality studies. Now, the more, one of the mortality studies done very carefully showed that testosterone and dihydrotestosterone were clearly associated with greater longevity. In other words, yeah. a lower mortality rate. And lower mortality means that the major causes of death are being reduced. And the major causes of death fill such a large area. And mm -hmm. the major causes of death are cardiovascular, about 50% plus or minus some, mm -hmm. uh, and cancer, about 25%. So uh, are we lowering cancer? Not so much cancer, but we're certainly lowering cardiovascular risk. Mm -hmm. um, there's some other things that we can lower cardiovascular risk, which we'll talk about sometime in the future, some mm -hmm. uh, additional right. treatments that you can use to compound the beneficial effects of testosterone. Uh, I kind of use myself as an example, mm -hmm. uh, as I sit here and talk to you, I'm 79 years old. Most mm -hmm. people find that uh, a little bit unusual that I'm still this energetic right. and wanting to expand my knowledge and my, uh, my career, uh, that I still have the energy for it. Mm -hmm. I've been on testosterone since age 50, I'm 79, yep. almost 30 years. Right. Uh, I have a little diabetes, it's very stable. I have a little cardiovascular uh, placking that we've discovered. It's never gotten worse in 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I pass all the stress tests. Mm -hmm. I outdrive just about everybody on the golf course my age. Amazing. Uh, again, there are some guys that still knock it past me, but not, <laughs> not too many. Uh -huh. uh, so physically, I'm maintaining a higher level than my peers the same age. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't want to retire. I have the energy to keep mm -hmm. uh, doing. And that one of the things about Maximus mm -hmm. is that Maximus is something that came up mm -hmm. that is something I always wanted to do. I just mm -hmm. didn't have the tools to organize and, and develop it. I have a lot of good ideas, but I never had a way of marketing them or putting them together in a protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, so the excitement for me was that here we've got what I think is the, the highest level of scientific forum mm -hmm. to put forward the best of what I know and the other specialists know on mm -hmm. uh, the issues of men's health, men's health, and the issues of problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of... Uh, part of the Maximus is to preserve the pearls mm. that we've learned for problem solving of common problems. Things okay. like premature ejaculation, go, go and ask the doctor for something. They don't have it. We do. Mm. Uh, Pyrone's disease. Uh, a lot of guys get diagnosed and they don't, well, they're advertising on TV. They have some new drug treatment. I can tell you, we can, we can reverse that without going into those types of things. So part of the forum will be uh, maintaining men's health as mm -hmm. well as having modules on common health problems 
right. from a variety of specialists from different uh, different areas that will contribute. So it really will be, I think, the optimal place for most men to go to get information about health and disease. Absolutely. And I think that's part of why we also put out so much content, unlike other telemedicine companies, is I think education is fundamental. And, you know, one of the things that that I find, especially as a psychologist, is there's really a dearth, um, not only to your point, because um, I actually trained psychiatry uh, residents uh, at, at UCSF Medical School, uh, a, a lack of um, sufficient medical training and education, but in the general public too, there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding. So that's why it's so great to have someone like yourself with a half a century of medical experience to be able to kind of communicate this to the general public in a way that's really easy to understand and accessible. Um, and like, for instance, the point that you just made about, you know, contrary to um, the, the myth uh, of kind of promoting cardiovascular disease, it actually may improve higher testosterone, may improve mortality. Um, and then I, I did want to touch on the other two things. Um, uh, is there a risk of, um, or a significant risk of hair loss or, or um, prostate issues from optimizing your testosterone? Or is that really more of a function of DHT? Well, your genetics determine the sensitivity of certain hair follicles to the presence of testosterone. Mm -hmm. So what happens as men get older and their testosterone goes down, they may start to... Oh, I think we lost. Sorry, you. I just got oh. a, a call that interrupted no my, my Zoom. Uh, the, uh, so if you normalize testosterone, you're gonna normalize the genetics. Mm -hmm. uh, so can hair loss return? Well, by the time we're starting to treat, it's kind of reached a stable endpoint. Mm -hmm. it, if somebody goes into hair replacement, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes they give androgen blockers to right. prevent the hair loss. I can tell you I've had horrible experiences with yeah. blocking testosterone to preserve hair. You have to decide, do you want hair or do you want health? Right. And yeah. the drugs that they use to block THT also block neurotransmitters for depression, for concentration. And as I said, low DHT, DHT actually uh, is uh, a better, uh, it has a better chance of improving mortality than total testosterone. Yeah. So DHT is not a bad hormone. It's just that it has for the people that have the genetics, they are going to be healthy bald. And uh, that's going to be always there. Now, mm -hmm. if you take somebody who's been stable and you put them on excess horse hormone replacement, you are going to get more hair loss than you, than you thought and more body hair. Mm -hmm. So it's going to grow where you don't want it and you're going to lose more. But that's usually in situations where you're going to supra physiologic uh, replacement. And when you get physiologic replacement, that is subtle enough that you don't get dramatic changes in either skin, acne, uh, hair loss, or body hair. Uh, and I saw more of that with replacement because you are going super physiologic with, uh, with testosterone shots, at least for a period of time. Right. And uh, even with topicals, you can uh, get an abnormally uh, increased production of DHT versus the total testosterone because the skin converts it. Yeah. And uh, so we don't have we don't go through the skin with natural improvement with the inflammatory. Right. That's such a great uh, point. I think the other thing points. that you mentioned was prostate mm -hmm. cancer. And, Correct. Uh, I think. Uh, the myth of prostate cancer and testosterone came many, many years ago based upon one or two uh, studies back mm -hmm. in the 40s. Uh, they've really been debunked. We have now the Urologic Association say there's no correlation between testosterone levels and prostate cancer or mm -hmm. replacement testosterone and increasing risk of prostate cancer. Um, in fact, if you use the hair loss DHT blocker, mm -hmm. you may have equivalent amounts of prostate cancer, but it's more aggressive. Mm. So taking away the DHT may alter the aggressiveness of prostate cancer if you got it, but you're not going to get prostate cancer at a higher rate uh, 
no matter what you do, you still need to be screened for it because it can happen no matter what your testosterone level is. That's such a great point. Yeah. And, and to, to reiterate that, because I think there's some jewels in, in uh, what you just said is, is one, DHT is not evil, as, as many men, unfortunately, have got that association. Um, and, and that's why, you know, the five alpha reductase inhibitors, the five AR inhibitors um, that people may be familiar with, especially finasteride, brand name Propecia, um, while, you know, a lot of folks take it for uh, hair uh, loss, you know, we decided as a company to not offer it because of the potential of those se sexual side effects, as you mentioned, but also because the, the idea of systemically suppressing DHT to sub physiological levels takes away that virility benefit and the, the, the sexual benefits and, and the masculinizing benefits um, of DHT because it is a beneficial hormone. Um, and the other thing that's really important too is um, TRT seems to increase DHT much more than enclomiphene. When they've done these head-to-head -head studies, there's a very slight increase in DHT with enclomiphene, but the T to DHT ratio, the ratio of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, actually does not change on enclomiphene. It does significantly increase the DHT to T ratio significantly increases on TRT. So while some guys on TRT may actually find um, uh, an aggravation of their androgenic alopecia or hair loss, um, that shouldn't actually be the case with enclomiphene. It's much more um, hair safe or hair friendly, so to speak. Um, excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shippen, for a super educational uh, podcast. It, it's so great to have someone like yourself that has such a wealth of both scientific and clinical experience to share with the world. And I know uh, all the many men who are watching this, who are trying to educate themselves, uh, are going to benefit tremendously from this. So thank you so much uh, for your time. And thank you so much for being an advisor to Maximus. Uh, you know, we, we are very uh, grateful to have uh, your expertise, um, along with a great panel of other medical advisors to bring the best in men's health and hormone optimization to the masses. Well, it's great talking to you. And uh, as I said, Maximus came into my life uh, really as something that I, I always wanted to do. And it just opened the door for me to keep that expression going. Awesome. Thank you so much.